It is such an honor and a great pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, Dr. John C. Mather, who's going to talk to us today about his work on the magnificent astronomical instrument known as the James Webb Space Telescope. Dr. Mather received his doctorate in physics from the University of California, Berkeley, after which he accepted a National Research Council fellowship at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. There, he led the proposal efforts for the Cosmic Background Explorer Mission, or COBE, before becoming the lead scientist for this mission at the Goddard Space Flight Center. In 2006, Dr. Mather shared the Nobel Prize for Physics with Dr. George Smoot for their work using the COBE satellite to measure the heat radiation from the Big Bang. This research has been fundamental to expanding our human understanding about the beginnings of our universe. And to give you an idea about the importance of this work, the physicist Stephen Hawking said, the measurements made are the greatest scientific discovery of the century, if not of all time. And the Nobel Prize Committee regarded the Kobe project as the starting point for cosmology as a precision science. Since then, Dr. Mather has led the science team for the James Webb Space Telescope. He is currently a civil servant and a senior astrophysicist at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. Additionally, Dr. Mather works to support the next generation of scientists by sponsoring summer interns working on science policy on Capitol Hill through the Society of Physics Students. We are so honored and absolutely delighted to have him speaking to us today. So please, please join me in welcoming Dr. John C. Mather. Well, my golly, what a lovely set of introductions. So I want to tell you the story today of uh, the Webb Telescope, James Webb Space Telescope, and uh, incidentally, the history of the universe and sort of some ideas about how we got here from, from the beginning. So it's a totally astonishing story, and uh, there's a lot of history to think about. But I'll just show you a few things that are on the screen in front of you. Um, we see in the upper left corner, it says NASA European and Canadian space agencies did this project together. In the middle, you see a big golden hexagon, which is the mirror of the telescope. It collects the light from the distant universe. Under the mirror is a big gray thing that you see. It's actually a huge umbrella, as big as a tennis court. And that whole thing was folded up to fit in, top, in the top of the rocket, which means it's a huge engineering accomplishment to do that. Um, so this project is on behalf of all of us human beings, uh, now and in the future. Uh, uh, there are about 10,000 professional astronomers in the world, and they can all use it. Uh, it took about 20,000 people to actually build this thing and put it back together and made it work. And anyway, it's huge. So when we say John did something, we did something. That's a, the we story is from beginning to end. If you actually think back on it, who was the first person who melted a rock and got some metal? Who was the first who melted some rock and got some glass? Uh, who's the first person who figured out all kinds of things uh, is lost in history. So, and we couldn't do what we do if they hadn't done what they did. So, and so I've always liked to start with thanking the people that made it all possible, most of whom we don't even know. But anyway, looking back in history. So, Questions that people always have. I had these as a little kid. Um, uh, I didn't at the time. I didn't actually know how to save them. Some of these questions. But where did we come from? Uh, nobody knows honestly. Uh, we have some of the story now. We can tell you uh, what is the co cosmic history. When I was a kid, it wasn't really known that we much had much of a history. That we didn't even know how the stars were made, much less the planets. Uh, are we alone? Well, everybody knew we were not alone because we had science fiction stories. <laughs> um, but honestly, uh, we don't know that for real. So we would like to know where are the neighbors. So we've been listening and we haven't heard anything. We are looking and we haven't seen anything yet. Uh, but uh, we, do, we do have one observational data point. We're alive. It's live right here. So we've been asking this fundamental question since the beginning of philosophy. Is life a miracle? Something that would only happen here? in the way that it has happened, uh, or is something that would always happen given a chance, which I call a thermodynamic imperative. 
And uh, scientists are beginning to change their minds. It used to be that uh, the left-hand side version was the favorite version. And now I think, I keep asking biologists, what do you think? And I think the right-hand side, thermodynamic imperative is more likely. So how far can we go? Well, darn not very far. Um, we can go to Mars. We know we can get there. Right now we could get you there. We couldn't get you back. Uh, so you better be friendly and they better send, we'll send you lots of food and water. Uh, and you better be really friendly because the habitats I've seen are about as big as a minibus. Oh, well, be friendly uh, and patient. But astronomers and you and I, we can all travel as far as we want with imagination. So the way that we astronomers do it, we take pictures at measurements. And then we use our imagination to tell you the stories that I'm going to tell you today. So some of these things we've sort of been aware of for uh, thousands of years. Uh, Lucretius, 2,000 plus years ago, uh, already was aware of the atomic theory. Uh, it was thought about, talked about a lot, um, and they didn't have the details, but they had evidence. So I, he sort of knew what we would say today. Things are made out of tiny things. They stick together. They fall apart. Uh, we, they were beginning to think about um, language and we're giving names to things. And um, anyway, wasn't exactly popular with the medieval monks uh, because they managed to destroy every single copy except one of this book. But nevertheless, we have it, which is its own kind of miracle. So uh, how did I get to be one of these people? This is where I spent my childhood uh, at this research farm of Rutgers University in far northern New Jersey, a mile off the Appalachian Trail. And so why was my dad there? He was studying dairy cows. Why was he studying dairy cows? Because he was born in southern Africa, and the cows were thin. And they had the magazines from home that said that cows are big and fat. So what's the difference? Let's find out. So he ended up doing that. Um, so I was out there in the countryside, and well, I wanted to do, do some science, but how do you do science in the country? You get all the books you can from the library. So it was mentioned that, uh, how, do you, how do you learn things? Well, if you really want to learn, you use whatever you got. So the library. The bookmobile came to the, light, to the farm every two weeks, and I got all the science books. Yeah, and I had friends, and people found me opportunities. But basically, I said, I want to, and people helped. And I think that's the sort of message for, that I give to everyone. Ask for help. If you want something, ask for help. And people usually want to help if you give them a chance. So a little history. Back in 1946, there's Lyman Spitzer, who was a famous astronomer before World War II. He was famous afterwards. In 46, after the war was done, he wrote a little paper that said, we should build telescopes in space because we could look up and down. And, uh, and we did. A few years later, he wrote another report that said, if you do it really well, you could polish the surface of an asteroid into a parabolic shape and to be able to see planets around other stars. Okay, pretty good for 1946. We couldn't do it then. In uh, roughly 1950, this is Sir Fred Hoyle. He gave the name to the Big Bang Theory, uh, which has completely confused everyone on planet Earth ever since. Uh, because it's hard to think of a Big Bang without thinking of a firecracker, which is exactly the opposite of what astronomers have seen. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more later, but sorry, Sir Fred. It was a bad name for this, but we haven't been able to get rid of it. So also in 1946, this guy showed up. So I looked a little smaller in 1946. Some little squee wormy, squiggly little guy. Anyway, so what happened then in 1948? Uh, people thought, well, we know about neutrons. We built a bomb, unfortunately, or fortunately, we built a bomb. Now we know all about nuclear physics, or just enough to calculate the early universe. So we already knew, uh, had a story about the expanding universe uh, because we'd seen distant galaxies running away from us at great speeds. So well, what, what about those early times? We can calculate now. So they said the universe should be filled with heat radiation, a leftover from those early times, and it should have a temperature of about five degrees above absolute zero, and which is pretty darn close considering slide rules and almost no other information in 1948. So nobody went to measure. It looked too hard. Uh, if somebody knew there were a Nobel Prize waiting for finding it, they might have tried harder, but nobody actually thought it possible. So 1948, no, no measurement was made. 
1954, my parents took me to the Museum of Natural History in New York City. We saw the planetarium show, and I understand we're going to get a new planetarium. Yay! And um, this is Mars as people thought it was. Canals. Okay, well, how does that happen? Well, they're not there. So what do people think? Well, it turns out it seems to be the blood vessels in the back of the observer's eyeballs. Uh, and I've seen that sort of pattern just once in life, and I say, I believe this is possible. So, drat, no canals on Mars. In 57, the Soviet Union was a huge, huge threat to this country for national security reasons. They'd been threatening us with uh, nuclear bombs in aircraft. And poop goes up a satellite, and suddenly they can fly over any time they like. Okay, this country is completely petrified. We better spend money on scientists and engineers and young people. So, okay, suddenly there are science fairs for me. So um, I've been a science nerd ever since. Um, in 58, um, NASA was formed in response to that. And there's a document of creating us. Uh, and it says, by the way, tell people what you're finding. It's the only na national science agency which has that in the charter. So we actually do some fair amount of effort to tell you what we're finding. Then there's Mr. Kennedy there, and he's going to tell us in 1962 that we're going to go to the moon. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. So there he was, promising the moon, and promising that we would take all the other things into account too. There was a lot of other things he knew, and we all knew we needed to take care of in this country. And he said, we're going to do them all, which is an interesting thing. People forget that. Um, anyway, he did. And it's... I am in awe. As he said, it's just 35 years after we had flown across the Atlantic. Now we're going to go to the moon. And how could you possibly? Well, here's the guy that did it. And James Webb, second administrator of NASA, went up to Jack Kennedy with a plan. He says, this is how we're going to do it. And there's a wonderful, not very well-known story about this, which is uh, this was before we had Excel spreadsheets. He was in the taxi cab going to see the president to make his budget request. He thought, well, I don't think I believe those scientists and engineers about the budget. He doubled the budget. Doubled the budget in the taxi cab on the way to see the president. It was about enough. Can you imagine what would have happened if he had not done that? It would have been a complete natural national embarrassment and disaster. And anyway, it was plenty hard for the country to pay for it. There's a, we, something like a half a million of us actually worked on the project. Can you imagine that? Anyway, it worked. So now coming back to science. So how do we know what we know? Uh, well, we need to survey the universe. So we use triangles as the ancients could have done. Uh, they would have understood perfectly if we drew these pictures for them, um, the top half. Um, and the ancient Greeks certainly did it well enough to know the size of the earth and the distance to the moon. And about right. Um, they couldn't get the distance to the sun with their methods too hard. Um, they would have understood the other story that if a if I promise you those two candles are identical, but one is feeder, they, we would say it's because it's farther away. We can calculate. So now we can survey distances to diff different objects. And this is important because now we know, although they did not know then, that light has a speed. So you know that you're looking back in time as you look at things that are far away. So you've got hmm, time travel machines in your eyes every day, and you don't think about it because you don't see very far back in time. But then when you look at the Andromeda Nebula, you, which you can see if you go out of town, uh, it's about several million light years away, several million light years 
several million years back in time. So now we survey the universe. We can measure the velocities of different objects coming toward us or away from us. If you uh, spread out the light of the sun or lots of objects in into a rainbow, quite often you'll see our dark or bright marks across the, the rainbow due to particular chemical elements. Okay, so now we can analyze the chemistry of some distant object like the sun. He even discovered helium in the sun. We name it after the sun because that's where we found it. Um, we can also discover sometimes that the patterns of the wavelengths are all shifted when we de measure distant objects. And we say it's because they're coming toward us or going away from us at a speed that we can calculate. So now we say, okay, now we can measure the distance to the things and we can measure the speeds of motion. And then we can draw a graph. And this is the first one that we ever had from 1929. Same year that the worldwide economy collapsed, now we discovered the universe is expanding, or at least we had a graph proving it. So it actually had been predicted in 1927 by George Lemaitre, who was a mathematician with a PhD from MIT. He used Einstein's equations to say this. He was also a parish priest in Belgium. Got to meet the Pope, and there's interesting stories there. At any rate, what does the picture show? On the horizontal axis, the distance of things. On the vertical axis, speed of motion away from us. And each little dot is a galaxy. Galaxy is more or less 100 billion stars orbiting the common center. And you see right away there's a trend here. The farther away they are, the faster they're going away from us. Okay, divide the distance by the speed, get the apparent age of the universe. First time in history that we ever knew there was such a thing as the age of the universe. Um, so pretty astonishing discovery. And a lot of people noticed. Einstein had, however, thought the opposite. He was completely surprised, hardly believed it at first, didn't really believe it until his theoretical calculations were shown to be in error. Can you imagine that? Anyway, another thing to point out, there are four little dots in the lower left corner with the velocities negative. They're coming toward us. It's going to be a wonderful collision of the neighbors with our galaxy in a few hundred, sorry, in a few billion years. We won't be here, but it will be very exciting for the people who are. So then what happened? Well, coming back to my story, uh, it was mentioned that um, I did my thesis at Berkeley. I attempted to measure the heat of the cosmic background radiation, uh, and I did so successfully from the ground in a very boring experiment. And then my thesis, the real thesis project, was an instrument designed by my advisor. He went up into high altitude on a balloon and did not function. I nevertheless got a job at NASA, and I thought, I'll do something else. That's way too hard to that kind of work. So there it is, uh, the building upstairs from Tom's Restaurant in New York City, which is famous on Seinfeld, the very same. Uh, and so I was there in, um, in 1974. NASA said, we need proposals for new science missions. Uh, we've, it's five years since we landed on the moon. What are we going to do now? My thesis project failed, boss. We should do something in outer space. OK, we'll call up our friends. We write a proposal. And we did. And that became the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite, which measured what we said it would do and earned that Nobel Prize that was mentioned. And away I'll show you. So there's the satellite. Um, and because it was designed by real engineers, it worked properly. And it had three instruments on board to measure the spectrum of the big, of the early radiation of the early universe. Oops, I almost said Big Bang radiation. Um, the expanding universe early radiation. Uh, we've made a map of that radiation and we also looked for the light of the first galaxies. So it went up in, went in November 18th of 1989, so almost onto its, what is it, 34th anniversary. And uh, it worked. Anyway, it's been followed up, and we'll show you what we got. Uh, this is the most important one. This is the one that was mentioned where about Stephen Hawking thought this was the most important thing. So the sky has got hot and cold spots on it, which we show as pink and blue blobs, and they're very, very thin. Um, the average temperature of the sky is 2.725 Kelvin, which we know very precisely, uh, and those spots are part in 100,000 brighter or fainter which is an extremely good result. So it's exactly what we needed to explain how come we're here. So if they were not there, then the universe would have just expanded without forming any objects. 
would have been just a cold gas by now. But we do, we are here. So, okay, that's pretty important. What makes the spots? Well, mostly cosmic dark matter, which we can't see, but we do wish it exists. The patterns expect affected by cosmic dark energy, which we also can't see, but we do do it exists. And lastly, if we ever know what quantum gravity is, it might predict these spots. So this is a test of quantum gravity in a way. So come back in uh, 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 years and we might know what made those spots. Right now, we don't know, but we just know they're there and we're here because of them. So now you say, okay, now I know what the universe was like when it was something we ought to be able to calculate what happens next. Well, it's too hard, but you should go look anyway. So I got to show my little graph of the spectrum. I went off to see the King of Sweden. I did indeed receive a nice check and formed that foundation and gave money to students um, and also to ballet students because my late wife was a ballet teacher. So in honor of the arts and her partnership. Anyway, so that was then and, and I was already working by then on the Webb telescope so I've been giving various versions of this talk now forever, um, and I love it. So, so what do we do to see if that story of the early universe is right? Well, the Hubble telescope was built with the claim that we would be able to see the first galaxies being born, because we all believed that theoretical predictions, we being astronomers, um, we believed some really smart people who said, we know that it happened very slowly. So they built the telescope. They said, we're going to take a picture of the first galaxies growing. We're going to see back in far, as far as we can in time. And we see back far enough, there won't be any galaxies out there. Well, that's not what happened. <laughs> they looked out and they could see galaxies as far as they could go. Yeah, what happens next? Well, okay, build us another telescope, please. <laughs> so that's the James Webb Space Telescope. Build one that can see farther back in time, farther out in space, and to see how that really happened. And that's just about the hardest problem we could think of to work on. So that's the James Webb Space Telescope. So here it is as uh, another view of it. There's the golden hexagon, six and a half meters across. Can I use metric units today? Okay, six and a half meters, it's 21 feet. Uh, and, the, um, and it's protected by that giant umbrella, five layers of metalized plastic. Uh, it is built um, by an international team, uh, including our Goddard Space Flight Center, which is uh, what, about 40 minutes east of here, uh, in Greenbelt. Uh, big company is north of Grumman. Uh, they're located mostly near LA Airport. Uh, our partners in Canada, Europe, and, and around the country. It's being operated from Baltimore, as we do the Hubble Space Telescope. And the telescope was folded up. I think I've got my scary movie in here to show you. Uh, how that was done. And it was launched on a European rocket from French Guiana. Well, why would you go there? It's because that's it's on the equator and it belongs to France or is part of France. So, and that's part of the contribution. So there it is, as we imagine it to be in outer space, but of course, really it's in outer space and it's completely in the dark. So imagine that being so dark that you can't see it except by starlight. So it was launched on Christmas morning, uh, almost two years ago, uh, which was itself a miracle because so many, many things had to go right that day. But that was the first day that we said we were ready and we were ready. They pushed the button and it went exactly where we wanted it to go, which means we are hoping for at least 20 more years of actual flight operations. So thank you very much for the rocket people that make a beautiful rocket. This is where we sent it. We sent it around a place called the Lagrange Point 2. Um, and the Lagrange points are places where the combined gravity of the sun and earth will pull your object around the sun once a year. So it stays with us in this pattern. So the, there are five of them. Um, the first three were found by Leonard Euler in 1750, and he, I suppose he had a pencil. No calculators. Um, at any rate, now we put it there because it's, uh, you can stay there all the time. It's uh, near the shadow of the earth, you orbit around it. And it doesn't get any farther away. So it's 1.5 million kilometers away and it's, uh, only 1% of the distance of the sun. So this is not to scale. And it's a great place to put a telescope. And here's my scary movie. Yeah. 
That's I've been scaring, it was scaring people for years with this. So if you're an engineer, you say, oh, well, that's going to be fun to build. If you're the test people, you say, how the heck am I going to prove that it works? If you're the budget person, you say, how am I getting enough money to pay for that? Um, if you're the astronomer, you say, yeah, I sure hope it works. <laughs> uh, and if you're us at NASA, you say, we are going to make it work, and how do we do that? Okay, we have checklists. We have redundancy. We have two of everything where it's possible. We have graduate, graduate review committees to come tell us when we're wrong. And once in a while, they say so. And we're very grateful for that. And we test and test and test. This particular unfolding was tested four times before we were sure it was right. And if you say, it wasn't there a simpler way to do that? No. <laughs> if you want to see these earliest galaxies, which was the scientific project that we said was most important, you need something this big and this cold. And cold, by the way, the telescope has to be cold. Otherwise, it will send out its own infrared light. And we're going to come to why do you need infrared light? But anyway, it has to be cold. Cold about 40 degrees above absolute zero. And that makes engineering very hard. So if you're an engineering student here, think about how all the materials change their properties when they get cold. Plastics get stiff. Oil doesn't work. Sometimes even metal doesn't behave. So how well does it work? Uh, well, we put it up and it unfolded just as we've said. It took us about six months to get it all set up and focused. So it's not in focus when we launch it, uh, but we eventually set it up and do an optical test. So the, what's shown here is if it were uniform gray, it would mean the optical surface was perfect. And the left side is what it was when we made it. On the right-hand side, it was after June 21st of uh, last year, had a bump on the mirror. Oops, people got pretty worried, but now in almost two years, we've only had the one bump. So it's not such a big deal. We do not understand exactly what happened there, but I think we think that actually the, what we've got is sand grains in space. They're called micrometeoroids, and uh, they travel at about 30 kilometers a second. So if they hit you, you would hurt. Um, um, but if, if you had one in your fingers, you'd never know it was there because it's so tiny. Anyway, so we're lucky about that. And it's not getting worse. So the telescope is still an excellent optical telescope. And what are we going to look at? We're going to use the telescope to see infrared light. So why infrared? Well, number one, uh, infrared light will go through dust clouds. So when you go over to the airport and they say, walk through this and we'll look through your clothes, they use uh, infrared or actually long wave fleets, millimeter wave to look through your clothes. We do the same thing with dust clouds out there. And so there's a star being born in this dust cloud and you can hardly see it because there's so much dust there. But you can just barely make out in the middle, there's a uh, something happening. So you could say, well, why is there dust in space? I thought space was empty. Well, not quite. Uh, that dust is actually debris from prior generations of stars that blew up and released uh, nuclear reaction products. Stars work by burning hydrogen and helium into heavier elements. And when they get old, stuff comes back out again, it gets recycled. So we here are looking around, our building, our room is made out of recycled stellar dust. Things that, stars that blew up have been recycled. So it's okay to be recycled, don't you think? <laughs> so if you could use infrared light, you could see through the dust quite well. So this is the Hubble capability for infrared. So we knew right away this was going to work. Now you can see this star is actually sitting there sending out jets of material as it's being born, which they often do and usually do. So we're now able to use this tool to see how our star is being born. Stars like the sun. Uh, we are able to see objects that are not warm enough to emit visible light. Uh, like this is object is called a planetary nebula, but it's not a planet. It just looks like one. Uh, and you see um, things that are not there when you use an ordinary telescope. In fact, on the right side, you see uh, there are actually two stars down in the middle. Here we have a magnified version. And this pretty amazing pattern is now explained by saying there are actually five stars there in the middle, and they're influencing the flow of dust coming out of dying stars. We even have a picture of dust coming out of a dying star pair. 
here are two stars going around each other. Every time they get close, some half uh, of the atmosphere of one of them gets pulled off into outer space. And that's the story we tell about the picture on the left. See those rings of dust out there? They're not circles. There's something weird and interesting going on. So we'd made our computer program, we made a simulation, and we say, a uh, story we tell on the right explains the picture on the left. So I told you about imagination. This is astronomers traveling at the speed of imagination with a computer. Okay, so when your kids are worrying about video games, some astronomers' video games. Okay, what else? Because space is expanding. Because distant galaxies are running away from us, we receive light that was sent out as short wavelengths. It comes to us as long wavelengths. So build an infrared telescope to see stars and galaxies as they were when they were young and hot, emitting short wavelengths. So, okay, three reasons to build a telescope to pick up infrared light. So what did we find? Here is our first data release from uh, last summer. Uh, and in the picture, we have a lot of interesting things. The, the stars have six spikes sticking out. Uh, ignore them. They're ordinary, basic stars. In the middle is a very large galaxy, very big, fuzzy thing with so much gravity that it can magnify and distort the images of the other things in there. If my mouse will show here. Yeah, see these funny-looking pink arcs? Those are the images of much more, much more distant gal galaxies that have been magnified and distorted um, by the gravity of that thing in the middle. Anyway, this is Einstein's given us a lens. Einstein told us space uh, is bent by gravity. And okay, so now we have a practical use, at least practical from an astronomer's perspective. So we are looking farther back in time than we could before. And we are really thrilled with this picture. Uh, we have been working on the story of how the galaxies grew. Uh, I told you we were going to see the first ones growing. And we saw some, and they were a big surprise. They were bigger, brighter, hotter than we expected. And some people said, well, then our story, whole story of the expanding universe might be wrong. And I think more likely our story of how the stars grow is wrong. But that's the current favorite explanation from astronomers. They've now got their computer simulation runs and it sort of matches this picture now. So it's no longer the big oh that it was, but it was certainly a big surprise. So we're really thrilled with that picture. Um, we have even seen uh, stuff orbiting around a black hole. So, okay, well, how do you see a black hole? Black holes, uh, nothing comes out of a black hole. So, but stuff falls in. So on the way, and it gets compressed to enormous temperatures and pressures. It gets bright and hot, and we can see that. And uh, so we are able to see the process of black holes growing with this tool. We are able to see the ma extremely magnified images of the distant galaxies. Here's one from that picture I showed you before. And it's called the sparkler galaxy because it's all covered with bright spots. And uh, we're now working on how does this mean? What does this mean? Does the galaxy grow all at once or does it grow from assembly little small objects first? And we're still working on that question. These are called globular clusters. We have even found a few stars that are individually magnified by like 10,000 or 100,000. So we see an individual star at an immense distances because of Einstein's lenses. And I thought that'll never happen, but it does happen. So here's a pretty picture. I just show you because we have a pretty picture. Um, this is uh, five galaxies, uh, and four of them are close together, and they're going to be merged into one in a few hundred million years. The two bright eyeballs right there in the middle are in the process of merging together. The one on the top has a black hole in it, and it's going to crash into the others. So it's going to be a very exciting time for those people, um, because there's probably a black hole in the middle of each one of these things, and the black holes are going to get together also, we think, to be determined. But we will not actually know this answer for a while. What else do we see? We saw a, a galaxy that had been attacked by another galaxy. Uh, the little red one in the upper left went flying straight through the center of the big one. And what you see is a splash. The splash ring is a whole burst of brand new stars that were born because of the splash. And it's, okay, that's interesting. Sometime we'll know what it means. Um, people are busy with their computers and calculations saying, not only is it beautiful, 
but this is what it tells us. This is a galaxy that looks like a slice of a sponge, um, and it used to look like that, but our infrared pictures tell us different stories. So why is there a hole in the galaxy, like this one in the lower right? Because we think a brand new, uh, oops, touch this thing and it loops. Um, a burst of brand new stars were born there if maybe uh, 10, 20 million years ago. They were so bright, they pushed out so much energy that they basically blew a bubble in the galaxy. Same way as you have bubbles in your sponge, gas pressure. So also to notice, see it says reprocessed by Judy Schmidt. She is a housewife in Modesto, California, and she gets her NASA data and she adjusts it so it looks better and you can see things better. So thank you to Judy. Uh, here's a very famous picture we used to call it the Pillars of Creation. Uh, this is an infrared picture which shows us even more clearly that there's a wind blowing from the top right to the lower left. You can see some pretty amazing objects being born in here. Let's see if I can get my mouse over here. Here's a brand new star that's born at the head of one of these columns. And anyway, this is another star formation laboratory. Hundreds and hundreds of brand new stars are being born in this cloud as we speak. And the wind that's blowing is from one of those previous generations of stars that made such a gas pressure. So we will know sometime how stars are born. Stars like the sun. Here's one being born right now. Um, this is an edge-on view of a, of a planetary system probably. Right in the middle, where we see this hamburger in the bun, right there is probably a star. And it's shining out in all directions, but you can't see it because we're looking edge on into the dust cloud. And so if you were to come back in a few hundred thousand years, probably the dust will be gone and the planets will be visible. So maybe we'll even be able to see the planets sooner, but anyway, something to work on. We certainly want to know where did the planets come from? Here's a big surprise in the last few weeks. Uh, it was thought that planet-sized objects would always grow around stars. Well, now that we've found pairs of things about the size of Jupiter that seem to be just there by themselves. A double Jupiter. Where did they come from? Well, big surprise for us astronomers. Um, as in, explain that, smart guy. Uh, sometime we'll know why they grew. Anyway, they found a whole bunch of them in the Orion Nebula. So how do you know about planets? Are uh, there planets like Earth? Well, we'd like to know. Uh, we have a very powerful way to study them with this telescope, which is if, the, if you wait long enough, a planet may go between you and the star, and the star will blink. You say, I saw something happen. Come back and it does it again in a few days. Say, now I know how long it takes it to go around. I can calculate what is that planet like. How hot is it? How big is it? Now I want to know, does it have an atmosphere? Well, if, you're, if your equipment is working and you're lucky, you can tell. Uh, because some of, the planet, some of the starlight goes through the atmosphere of the planet on its way to the telescope, and you can do the chemistry. And so, so far, the answer is big planets are atmospheres. They have atmospheres, and they have chemicals in them, all kinds of interesting molecules. And the little ones so far are blank. So I'm sorry, we have not found another little Earth, not yet. And we are also not very disappointed because we did not think this was the right way to find them. For that, astronomers said, well, we know what we need next. Build us another telescope, even more powerful than this one, that's able to actually take pictures of an Earth or we need a star like the sun. That's about the hardest project we can think of right now. So we said, that's the next one to do, please. Uh, but it'll take a couple of decades, at least. So if you're a student, you get a chance to work on it, either to help build it or to help use it, and or even to help argue about it. So anyway, please wish us luck in that plan. So just a few more pretty pictures to show you here. It's good old Jupiter. Its red spot is no longer red because we're using infrared and you couldn't see that anyway. So we have to sort of invent colors to show you. Um, but it's pretty. It's got satellites. It's got a ring around it. Here is an asteroid attack. Uh, we launched a piece of metal to fall into an asteroid to see what would happen. And why do we care? Because uh, we need to be able to move them when they might be threatening to Earth. So we, we watched it, Hubble Telescope watched it uh, 
and this thing moved about five times as far as you would have expected if it was just billiard ball collisions. So we're learning how to move an asteroid. We looked at Titan. Titan is a, a satellite of Saturn, and it's got only one of the big atmosphere. It's got a nitrogen atmosphere. It is cold out there that have rain and lakes and rivers and clouds and weather, and they're made out of methane and ethane. So, okay, let's go look. So we are going to be landing a quadcopter over there in 2034. And we'll take little hops. And there's an amazing engineering accomplishment there, how to fly a helicopter there. More later, if you want. Um, we took a picture of Neptune. It's got satellites and rings. And these are named after Greek uh, mythological people. We got a picture of Uranus. And the satellites are named after Shakespearean characters. Um, and you can see this one is different from all the others because you can look at the pole. It just happens that um, at this time in its orbit, we can look near its pole. Uh, it's the only satellite, only planet in the solar system where the spin axis is more or less in the plane of the orbit instead of perpendicular like ours. So we get to have a lovely view of the rings. So there's lots more to tell, but I maybe will stop and have some questions. Um, and we'll see what else you want to talk about. But thanks so, so much for coming to hear the story. Thank you very much, Dr. Mather. It was fascinating. So uh, we have two mics on the either aisles. Uh, please. Uh, form small, uh, small lines in there and, and go ahead and ask, ask your questions. Uh, thank you, doctor, uh, for your talk and your kind words about Dragonfly. Uh, but uh, have, is there ever a plan to actually polish the surface of an asteroid and turn it into a mirror? Uh, probably not. Okay. It's really, really, really hard. <laughs> uh, there are plans to visit an asteroid and bring back pieces. Uh, we've launched the Psyche mission just recently to an asteroid which seems to be mostly metal. So we'll be learning about it. Uh, some people claim those uh, metal asteroids are worth a fortune. Um, we'll find out later if they really are. Yeah. No, it's actually we have to do easier things first than polishing up an asteroid. Uh, hello. Um, thank you for your talk. I wanted to ask, we always see like pictures from these uh, telescopes. I wanted to ask why, is it possible to see video or why do we not see like oh. moving images? Right, so no videos. Oh, well, I guess one of the basic reasons is hardly anything in astronomy moves very fast. Uh, so a, a video of that really showed you how things move would be awfully slow. Uh, we do once in a while show you a video of how we think it happened, like that animation of the two stars going around each other. But we have to make that up. That's a computer version of of what we think is going on out there. Would it would it be feasible to have like long long time video? Um, it's possible. You can, we can observe. Uh, we certainly observe things over long periods of time, but mostly nothing happens except cosmic rays hit the detectors, and we got little flashes that we don't like. So take them away. Um, there are things that happen a little quicker, like in the solar system. The thing that's most active to watch is the sun. And the sun is boiling all the time. And, and if you get the right telescope, you can see the things bubbling up. every. It's, it changes all the time very quickly. So that's a, a new area of research, too. Okay, what's the best thing about working at NASA? Well, golly gee, it's, um, I just love working there. There's a short version. Why do I like it? I guess I love working with the people because we have brilliant people to work on who are wonderful to work with, and we have things that are really worth working on, things where we're going to discover something nobody ever knew uh, by building something nobody ever had. So combination of people and valuable projects. 
So I think I only work on the astronomy part, but other people work on things with very definite practical importance, like let's watch the Earth and see what we're doing here. And so there's some, some things that have really daily importance to us. Anyway, good question, thanks. Oh my goodness. Well, we can, we can send people to the moon and we can send people to Mars. And in principle, we can send them other places, but so far it hasn't been worth planning that trip. Uh, we could send them to fixed telescopes in outer space. Uh, so we haven't designed any yet that can be repaired, but we're working on that part. We have one that we're working on that could be repaired in future by astronauts, uh, even 1.5 million kilometers away from here. Uh, so that's coming. Um, can we get out of the solar system? I don't think so. It takes too darn long. Right. Yeah. But if you want to go to Mars uh, and come back, we do know what we have to do. We just haven't done it yet. I'm not quite sure I understood that question. So um, you're asking about the, the spectroscopy is spreading out the light into the spectrum and the chemistry? Okay, so how does that work? Well, um, as an example, when you launch a fireworks rocket on 4th of July and you see the bright colors, if you spread the light out and into the rainbow, you'll see it's all only a handful of different colors. Different, different chemical element that they put in there has its own wavelengths. So when we see that same pattern somewhere else, we say it's the same chemicals. So how do we know what chemicals are out there? We've got them all here in the laboratory. We measure them all. Ah, oh, good question. Um, yes, we can be fooled. Um, if we see, if we only saw one wavelength, we'd say we don't know which kind of chemical it is. But if we see two or three or four, they have a pattern that shifts all together. So we say, okay, hydrogen has cer certain set of wavelengths. If we see all of those, but they're all wrong by a certain multiplier, we say, and we know it's hydrogen, but it's moving. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Okay, well, I think all of us were aware of how risky it was to unfold it in space because not only you see how complicated it is, but there were about 180 little things called non-explosive actuators, uh, which um, everyone has to work. We call them single point failures. So if anyone doesn't work, we're doomed. So how do you make sure they work? Well, this is like packing your parachute. You have to do it perfectly every time. So how do you do that? You watch and you watch and you watch and you, you just check because uh, you can't, these things you can't, prove that they work because you did it yesterday because it's not the same one as you used yesterday. So that's why it's tricky. So we unfolded that thing four times to make sure it would unfold properly and we watched the people putting those little thingies together very carefully. It's the first time we've focused it that way in space. The Hubble was built to be focused in space, but when they had a focus problem, it wasn't enough because they had made it wrong. That's a whole other story.
Well, actually, uh, the plans themselves are extremely hard to find at all. So they're not really powerful tools for looking back in time. Um, but the farthest we can see directly is that map with the pink and blue blobs on it. We see the universe as it was at age of about 400,000 years. Before that, the universe was opaque. So we cannot see farther back in time than that with that method. Now we can calculate and imagine, but we can't see. So I'm not quite sure I got your question, but if you're asking about the, the black holes, how do we know they are black holes? Oh, how, yeah, okay. So the ones we know about mostly are single. But uh, once in a while, we see them merge together. Uh, and a whole observatory was just built to do that. It was called the LIGO. And they did find that uh, black holes can orbit around each other and find merge into one with an outburst of radiation that we could see. And they even discovered that neutron stars can do that. Pairs of neutron stars can orbit around each other and merge together and turn into a black hole plus heavy elements that come spitting out. So we think, I look at my little gold ring here, that that gold came from neutron stars crashing together and blowing up. So very recycled, <laughs> yes. Oh, well, how did we get it there? Well, um, we, we had two ways to get it around. One was to fly it around on a big airplane in the United States. Uh, and we were able to do that just for the telescope part. To get it to French Guiana, we put it on a boat and send it through the Panama Canal. So just like any other boat, except it's a very special boat that was just spe specially made for that trip, or actually, or for for rocket pieces. And we didn't tell people where we were going until we got there. <laughs> there was some suggestion and hint that some people might be hostile to our telescope. Why did we put it out to L2? Um, well, number one, it's a good place to go because the sun, the earth, and the moon are always on one side, meaning you can put up your umbrella and you're protected from all of them at once. And so that's the only place in the solar system like that. And it also isn't all that far away from home. So we're able to talk back and forth on the radio to it. It takes five seconds for the commands to get from here to there and back each way. Yeah. We do. He's asking, do, is the orbit stable? The answer is no, not quite. So we have to fire the jets occasionally. And um, that's one of the things that limits the lifetime of the observatory. When we run out of fuel, it goes away. Actually, we like it where it is. L4 and L5 are not better for us. Um, they're harder to get to, and they don't have. Yeah, anyway. So it's easier just to manage the thrust of the rockets better. Okay, so he's asking about dark matter, and we deduce the presence of dark matter uh, from a lot of effects it has of gravity. Gra dark matter has gravity, and that's the only thing we really know about it. Uh, so we see uh, the galaxies spin too fast in the sense that they would fly apart if there weren't more gravity in there than we can find. We, so Vera Rubin here in town was a person who really worked that out a long time ago. And many people said she should have gotten her Nobel Prize for it, but she didn't. 
Anyway, so we measure the spins of galaxies. We measure how the galaxies orbit around each other. We measure the how the light is bent around the galaxies, all these ways to have measure the masses of things. I all say there's more mass than we can account for. So we call it dark matter. So it's all deduction. Oh, by the way, we have been working for decades to look for dark matter in the laboratory. We haven't seen a single thing. It is so frustrating. <laughs> but people have not given up. One of these days, we might find something. Um, actually, it's a tricky question because space doesn't seem to even be a thing. So how can it expand? Uh, but we say it's expanding, uh, so it's more of math. And it, it's a more of a story we tell. Uh, we say space is expanding, or we say that galaxies are rushing away from us. And they mean the same thing. And they have the same equations. Uh, so it's tricky, isn't it? Uh, well, the dark matter presumably participates in the expansion along with the other. So if I had a dark matter detector, I'd be able to say I have a cup full of it right here. Uh, and it presumably is flying right through the house as we're standing here. We don't feel it. And there's so little of it that we can't feel its gravity either. But presumably it's there. Your question is one of the hard ones. Actually, it does affect the image, but not too badly. So what we are able to compensate a little for it by refocusing the telescope. Oh, why is it gold? Um, actually, the mirrors themselves are made of beryllium because it's really light and stiff, uh, but they're coated with gold, a very small amount of gold to cover that big, big area because it reflects the infrared better. So are you asking about how, how the gas controls it? Oh, the renewable energy source. Um, well, we use solar power for the running all the electric things. So it has big solar panel uh, for controlling the... For the rocket jets, um, we use ordinary chemistry, old traditional kind of rocketry. Uh, we did think about this, what we call solar electric propulsion, which uses uh, solar energy to heat up something or propel it out much faster. Uh, but it's more complicated and we didn't need to do it, so we didn't. So we said, okay, by the time this thing is old in 20 years, people will say, well, that was great. We know on another one, a different one. Oh, uh, well, we've used tools, ordinary tools that you would use in any machine shop. So some of them would be carbide tools. Some of them, actually, we use diamond tools for things. Uh, we said diamonds for cutting mirrors. Well, the, mostly we're just concerned about how is the metal going to be when it's cold um, because it will shrink a little bit. It may get stiffer or springier. Uh, and so we have to make sure that's all worked out in advance. 
Um, it's actually pretty tricky that the, everything shrinks when it's cold, because different amount, different materials shrink different fractions. So there's, we didn't show you the design of how it's done, but everything has to allow for the different materials to shrink different amounts. The beryllium shrinks differently from the carbon fiber structure that it's on. And the aluminum instruments and the beryllium instruments, and the, they all shrink different amounts. So it's really pretty interesting, tricky stuff. The damage to the solar panels, the most likely damage would be another uh, particle hitting some of the solar cells. And so they're wired up so we will still have plenty of power when some of the solar cells are damaged. Um, so there's, it's made with lots of extra power. Oh my goodness, so what's the ultimate fate of the universe? Well, currently, the prediction is, and the measurement says, that it's accelerating. It's going, it's expanding faster and faster every year. And nobody asked for that, as far as we know. We don't know why it's happening. So we did not predict it. We do not have a good reason of why it's there. Um, but we saw it. So the, if that's the story, then the universe is going to keep on expanding. Distant galaxies will run away from us pretty fast. And if you wait for a trillion years, that we'll probably only see the one that we're in. And after that, what happens the next? Uh, well, it is claimed that the stars will all turn into black holes. And then it's claimed that after in extremely long periods of time, the black holes will evaporate also. So empty, very, very empty universe. Mm. So we're not going to be around to find out. Thank you all for such interesting questions.